<laughs> it's my pleasure to be able to introduce tonight's speaker, uh, Mary Beth Ruskai. Uh, Dr. Ruskai is internationally known and widely published scholar. She works in the area of mathematical physics. Currently, she's a professor at the University of Lowell in Massachusetts. Last year, she spent at the Quran Institute in New York. For those of you who don't know what the Quran Institute is, let me tell you that is really prestigious. I mean, you get paid for going and doing your own research. No place have I heard of a better deal than that. <laughs> She's also an affiliate of the physics department at Harvard University. I first met Mary Beth a couple years ago when she talked on a sub subject similar to what she's going to talk about tonight for the American Women in Mathematics at a summer meeting in Salt Lake City. Her title is Women in Science, Breaking Through Cultural Barriers. I might mention it was because of a cultural barrier that I turned out to be a mathematician. You see, I started out with the dreams of being a veterinarian. My grandfather was a veterinarian, and I always loved working with large animals, cows, horses, sheep, pigs, things like that. But I was told in high school that I had zero chance of getting into vet school because the state that I was from, Missouri, at that time had no vet school, and I would have to come to Iowa State, all right? And they had this thing about accepting women from other states. Now, maybe if you were an Iowa resident, you could get in, but not if you weren't. So I decided I would become a physicist, all right? Well, that was maybe, so, maybe okay. Well, during my second year in college, I was taking a calculus class. I walked into the class the first day, only woman in the class. Now this was rare. Not the fact that I was the only, not the fact that there should have been more women, but in fact that there was a woman in the calculus class. That was what the rarity was. And in fact, the professor of the class was very disgruntled at this fact. He was a crusty old German fella, and he liked to tell off-color jokes to the fellows in the class, and he did not want a female sitting in his class. So he did the very best he could to get me to drop out by proceeding to call on me every day for every question. Now, I didn't realize that I had the option of dropping out. I was so naive that I thought once you signed up for a class, you were in it for good, and you either passed or you failed. So I knew darn good and well that if I intended to pass, I was going to have to learn calculus. And I did, and I discovered that I liked it, and I became a mathematician. So it was this cultural barrier that in fact, uh, or social barrier, or whatever it was, that made me a mathematician. <laughs> So it is my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Mary Beth Ruskai, who's going to talk to us about women in science, breaking through cultural barriers. Oh. I forgot, I forgot. I'm supposed to make some other announcements. I got so carried away here. I would like to, like to say, first of all, that tonight's lecture is sponsored by the GSB, uh, the Committee on Lectures, the Women's Week Committee, through the Women's Center, and uh, that our signer is Christine Lippincott, for, who's signing for those who are um, hearing impaired. And that after tonight's talk, there will be a reception at the Sloss House, uh, sponsored by the Women in Science and Engineering. And if you don't know how to get to the Sloss House, well, just follow some of us who are going over. You walk out past the fountain, across past the Campanile, and then turn to your right. Thank you. Mary Beth. Thank you. Um, I wonder, do I actually need the microphone? Can you hear me without the microphone? We, can we turn it off? How do we turn it off? <laughs> I'm a theoretician. Um, well, <clears throat> I want to talk about cultural barriers because I think that cultural barriers are by far the biggest barriers that women face in trying to do science. And it's a multifaceted barrier. It's a cultural, involves cultural stereotypes about women, cultural stereotypes about science, and uh, some other things you'll see as you go along. Now, being a scientist, I feel I should have at least one or two slides to show. <laughs> and let's see how big the cultural barriers are. Where, for example, was the biggest drop occur? Well, standards from the American Physical Society. Only 14% of girls study high school physics, 26% of boys. That means that 86%, the vast majority of the girls, decide not to study physics before they've even encountered a physicist or a physics course. Uh, and physics, of course,
course, is the only subject, but by not studying physics, you certainly make it impossible to go on without at least doing some, some backup work in physics, chemistry, engineering, at a minimum, you make it very difficult in math or computer science, biology, medicine. Well, this is not surprising, and it's fairly well known, and people usually make a big deal about the fact that twice as many boys take physics as girls. Let's look at the data another way. Who doesn't study physics? 86% of the girls, 74% of the boys. The difference isn't nearly so big, and notice that the fact of the matter is that in our society, most people don't study physics. <laughs> <laughs> Three quarters of the boys do not study physics. Okay? There are cultural barriers to everybody studying physics. And although physics is considered masculine in the sense that it's not feminine, it's not a virile mocking thing for a high school boy to study. <laughs> now that's not to say that boys have it bad too. They do have it bad too, but not nearly so bad as girls. For one thing, if you're good at sports you can and you're male, you can overcome the stigma of getting an A in a math course. But it's much more difficult for girls for a variety of reasons. Physics is considered masculine. Um, there is also the element of conformity. Studying physics is not conformist. I, I live in a suburb of Boston adjacent to Cambridge in what is probably the world's highest concentration of prestigious academic institutions, research institutes, and high-tech companies. And the average man in my neighborhood is not a nuclear physicist. Most men are not physicists, and I think it's very important to remember that I'm not entirely sure. I know that in a perfect world, a lot more women would study physics. I don't know whether or not in a perfect world, 50% of physicists would be women. What is absolutely certain is that in a perfect world, 50% of women will not be physicists. 90% of women will not be physicists. Okay. Even in a perfect world, most women won't be physicists, most women won't be engineers, most women won't be scientists. Why is that so significant? Because in our culture, as we may have emphasized last night, conformity is a very, very part, important part of the culture. And if more women are going to study science, then our society must become much more accepting of cultural diversity of all kinds in women. It certainly is a problem for women scientists frequently that, uh, well, it's actually, I'll tell you, it's been a long time since I've gone to a scientific meeting and been the only woman. It, it has happened in the past, but it's not so common anymore. But being isolated, being the only woman amongst a group of scientists is not the only problem women scientists have. Uh, it's also sometimes very awkward to be the only scientist amongst a group of women. <laughs> okay. Now, in recent years, there's been a growing literature that goes under the name gender theory, gender difference theory, feminist critique about science. I particularly dislike the latter name because it suggests that if you disagree, you're not a feminist. Um, but anyhow, these there have been these names, and it seems to me that most of these critiques um, have missed the point. And the point is not that science is perfect, science deserves some criticism, but you don't get constructive criticisms by stereotypes, caricatures. And there's the gender difference theory has, promotes on the one hand a masculine, scientific, objective, logical, abstract, structured view of the world, and consider this in complete opposition to a supposedly feminine, unscientific, creative, intuitive, connected, nurturing, emotional aspect of the world. I'd like to read you a quotation about this topic by someone who, talking about mathematics, described, and I quote, the feeling of mathematical beauty, of the harmony of number, of forms, of geometric elegance. This is a true aesthetic feeling that all real mathematicians know, 
and surely it belongs to emotional sensibility, unquote. That sounds pretty radical, emotional sensibility for mathematics. The quote I read to you was from an article by the great mathematical physicist Henry Poincaré, written almost a century ago at the turn of the century. If you talk to scientists about what they do, science is creative, it is intuitive, it is emotional, it is all these things. The, the picture that's created is very false, and it's false for a number of reasons. Uh, in many cases, and I was very pleased last night when Rita Mae Brown talked, she didn't talk about creativity in science, but she did not confine creativity to a particular group of fields. Creativity was a way of thinking, a way of viewing things. You can have, re I'm sure she'll agree, and she probably has lots more examples than I do, very uncreative hack writing. And you can have very, very creative science. Unfortunately, some of the supposed gender difference theory doesn't seem to understand what creativity is. Sherry Turkle, for example, in her book on computers and the second self, um, alleges many gender differences, particularly uh, regarding creativity. Her problem is that she seems to be confused about the difference between creativity and spontaneity. Anything that's spontaneous, she considers create creative. If you applied her approach to music, you would be forced to conclude that jazz, because of its improvisational structure, is very, very creative, whereas the classical music of Bach and Beethoven, which is so structured, is totally non-creative. Um, I think that by using an analogy to music, if you start to read some of this literature, you see how ridiculous some of the theories are. Many people make very much of the fact, or the allegation, that in mathematics there's only one right answer. Now, first of all, that's not true. Uh, I think most of us who work in the field know, for many of the more basic theorems, that there are often several proofs, several different ways of looking at a problem. Um, even something as basic as 2 plus 2 equals 4. I mean, if you want to do your arithmetic over the field of integers mod 3, 2 plus 2 equals 1. Okay, there are different possible answers, different possible viewpoints. However, it is also true that there do, under certain circumstances, exist very well-defined right and wrong answers. The question is, is this kind of existence of occasions where there are, is one answer, occasions where there are definite right and wrong answers, some kind of stumbling block to creativity. Again, a musical an analogy will yield some insight. In music, there is, after all, an absolute standard for middle C. If you're going to play a musical instrument, you tune your instrument to middle C, and then you tune the rest of the s uh, strings to agree with it. If you're, if you're in an orchestra, everybody has to stay tuned to the same standard. The fact that there is a definite middle C does not in any way prevent music from being creative. Similarly, the fact that there are occasionally right and wrong answers doesn't prevent science from being creative. The problem is that we don't let most people know that. If we taught students, young children, music, the way we teach young children arithmetic, we would teach them to tune musical instruments in great detail and never, ever allow them to listen to music. That's the way we teach them mathematics. The problem is that mathematics is beautiful, it is creative, it is intuitive, and most people don't ever get to hear that or to feel that. And that's very, very sad. One of the very frustrating things that um, I've heard women scientists talk about since I've been discussing these issues is how much they do enjoy doing science and the beauty of science and how frustrating it is for them to be unable so often to share that beauty and that joy with other women who aren't scientists. I could go on on this subject uh, for a long time, but I'd like to get to some other issues. And while it is true that science is creative and intuitive, it's also true that science does have its logical, objective, structured portion. In the past, this has been emphasized because it's what distinguishes science from other fields. Unfortunately, this has created a very false picture of science. The big mistake of the gender difference theorist is to think that there is some kind of contradiction 
between that aspect of science, which is, after all, object and logical, and traditional feminine nurturing emotional values. Let me give two examples. One very far from my field is the idea of double blind drug tests. I mean, if you read the newspaper, one has the feeling that scientists want to deliberately withhold treatment from sick people for the sole purpose of constructing abstract scientific tests. That's absurd. Okay, the fact is that most experimental drugs don't pan out. Frequently, when you do double blind studies, the people who get the drugs have serious side effects. The people who get the placebos are the, or the standard treatment are the lucky ones. Okay, the concept of double blind testing, and one doesn't have to endorse every bureaucratic rule of the F FDA, but good scientific double blind testing is essential for precisely the same basic caring, nurturing reasons that are thought to be so feminine. Let me give a, a very different example. The gender difference theorist going back to Carol Gilligan, and it's not clear how much of what she said was in, ever intended to apply to science, make a big distinction between a supposed connected mode of feminine reasoning and a very abstract mode of male reasoning. Now, as a mathematician, I do a lot of abstraction, and one of the interesting things about abstracting is that it allows you to see connections between seemingly dissimilar objects. For example, if you take the notion of symmetry, and if people don't know anything about mathematics, I want you to take your most basic, fundamental, intuitive notion of symmetry, okay? Everybody knows what that is. There's another notion that's very mathematical that consists of certain types of arrays of numbers called matrices. You would think that these had nothing whatsoever to do with each other, and yet if one studies a subject called abstract group theory, one sees an amazing resemblance. This resemblance is not irrelevant or ergodic, or, or not ergodic, irrelevant or exotic, okay? But it's uh, very basic in mathematics, and it turns out, subject called group theory, that the result is very important in applied work. It allows chemists and physicists to use spectrosity, spectroscopy to elucidate the structure of molecules. It's very important in virtually every aspect of biochemistry and biomedical research. There are important applications of this abstraction that allows mathematicians to see similarities between nu numbers and symmetry. So the main point that I want to make is that this entire, not only is science creative intuitive, but this entire apposition is a false apposition. There's much more overlap. But the biggest flaw, in my opinion, in gender difference theory is not just this caricature of science, which has led to so much totally uninsightful work, but that the basic premise of gender difference theory is to emphasize normative behavior. All of the emphasis is on very, very small differences between groups of people. And it really doesn't matter whether those groups of people are characterized by sex, by race, by ethnic background, by religion, in all case, the differences between the norms are very, very small, whereas if you look within the group, the differences between individuals are enormous, much, much larger than the differences between these very, very small norms. By emphasizing this norm behavior, and I mean, there may be some interesting abstract sociological research to be done here, but as far as practical social change, by emphasizing this type of normative behavior, you are promoting conformity rather than a tolerance for diversity. And going back to what I said in the beginning, a t much greater tolerance for diversity and much less emphasis on conformity is, in my opinion, the biggest obstacle. There's a lot of debate about whether or not these minor differences we observe are due to biology, rather than culture. Now, I'll say something about that in a few minutes, but I think the question about whether it's biological or cultural is by far the least important one. Okay, right now, 20% of the PhDs in mathematics to U.S. citizens are going to women. 
okay, a very, very large number of women are doing very well. And there are lots of women in other fields. The roster of women in physics has several thousand women. Um, I don't know what the figures are for SWE, but I know that there, you know, just in the Boston area alone, there are hundreds of women computer scientists and electrical engineers, probably at least a thousand. The real issue, okay, is not whether differences, if they exist at all, are biological or cultural, but how do we regard these women who do, in fact, become mathematicians, become physicists, become engineers? Do we regard them as real women, or do we regard them as deviants? And I don't care whether they're supposed to be biological deviants or cultural deviants. The real issue is they're real women, okay? Let's go back to this question of, you know, the difference between whether or not 50% of women would be physicists or whether or not 50% of physicists would be women. I think that the women's movement needs to expand its definition of the word choice. There are more choices that need to be emphasized than just whether or not to have an abortion. And I remember when the women's movement started, you know, when I was growing up, it was sort of the accepted thing that for you're a woman, of course you would get married and have a family and raise children. That was the only thing to do. And then the women's movement came along in the, in the early 60s and promoted the idea that, no, actually you shouldn't do that. You should have a career instead. The problem was we went from everyone should be a homemaker to everyone should have a career, thus alienated a large group of women who wanted to stay at home or already had stayed at home and raised their children. And then things went from there. Then they said, well, no, actually, that's not right. You should combine a career and child raising. And then the debate got, you know, should you have children before 30, after 30? Should you work part time when you're having children? Should you take six months off? Should you take a year off? And there's this endless spate of articles in the newspaper, all of which seem to be looking for the perfect lifestyle for women. That's the wrong approach. The fact is that there are lots of different acceptable lifestyles, and individual women are going to have to make these choices. And I get very disturbed by some of the things that I see on issues like child care. Child care is obviously important for people who want to make the choice of career and family. But the emphasis is on choice, and I don't care if that is the majority choice, okay? The reason child care is important is to preserve the option of choice. It is not important because it is unacceptable to be a single woman scientist because that's a miserable fate worse than death. I much prefer being alive I'm having a lot of fun, okay? <laughs> We need women role models, not to show young women that yes, it's possible to have a career and a family, but to show young women that it's possible, okay, to have a satisfying life in many different ways with many different career patterns and with many different lifestyles. We have to avoid the mistake when talking about women in science to saying, of pretending that it's only okay to have an unconventional career if you have a very conventional lifestyle. You can have any combination of the above. Now, having said that I really don't consider the biology versus culture debate to be very important, um, I am going to talk about it a little bit, mostly because having been in New York for the last year, I'm a little fed up with opening the New York Times and finding some big front page article. Uh, it, I don't know where the New York Times finds these people. But someone has to do is find some minuscule difference, no matter how shoddy the research, no matter how small the difference, no matter how ridiculous the evidence, and it's front page news. Um, in fact, there's an enormous uh, amount of evidence for cultural differences, and particularly if you look at women in different cultures, in different countries, uh, and some of it is very surprising. It doesn't correspond to any of our cultural stereotypes. Barbara Wilson did a interesting study for the Committee on the Status of Women in Physics a few years ago and found some things that were amazing. One in particular, for example, there was a Middle Eastern country which at least my own personal cultural stereotypes does not, I don't think this country is particularly enlightened as far as it's, uh, the status of women go and in fact there are virtually no women professors in this country. However, physics is not considered masculine and 50% of the bachelor's degrees in physics go to women in that country. That's an amazing cultural difference. 
I would particularly like to share with you, and I'm going to use this example, uh, some data that I found from She tested children, and I think it was in the eighth grade, in 20 different countries in five different subject areas. And here's a summary of her results. As you can see, in some countries, the, oh, sorry, this is the wrong one. <laughs> in some countries, the Belgians are really great. I don't know what the Belgians are doing right, but they're really great. In some countries, particularly Belgium, the girls did better than the boys. Plus means girls did better. Some, in some sub subjects, quite a few countries, the girls did better than the boys. In some countries, the boys did better than the girls. If you look at her data in more detail, one of the things that you discover is that the differences in every single case, the differences between the countries are much, much larger than the differences between girls and boys. Um, in three of the subjects, there was no, there were no overall persistent differences. In the case of measurement and geometry, there were overall differences between the girls and the boys. And so she looked very carefully at the geometry scores and produced this table. It's going to show you how important. Uh, in this particular table. She broke down the geometry score, and an asterisk, which you can barely see on the right, means that the difference was statistically significant, and they're arranged in order of increasing performance. Now, you notice that in the top group of countries, the difference between the girls and the boys is statistically significant in only one case, whereas in the bottom group of countries, the difference is statistically significant in four out of five cases. Okay. Yes, in general, in the countries with good mathematics education where the overall scores are high, the difference between the girls and the boys is not significant. Whereas it's very significant in the countries with low scores, and uh, you notice one dominant country on the chart with low scores, the girls and the boys, the U.S. is right down there at the bottom. The uh, small differences between girls and boys SAT scores that people make so much fuss about in this country seem to be mostly an artifact of a very, very bad math and science education. And that's really what you can keep from the uh, I Because the educational systems are so different, it's really not fair to compare countries. However, I can't resist being really cynical. I mean, look at this 1.8 difference between the boys and girls in the U.S. that the New York Times makes such a big deal about. If you want to be really cynical, you might look and see American girls are one of the few groups in the world that American boys can beat. I mean, who else can they beat? They can beat them. <laughs> they can beat boys from Luxembourg, Nigeria, Swaziland, Thailand, Sweden, and American girls. <laughs> You know, if anyone can find a way to get, you know, the New York Times to print that, I'd like to know. <laughs> um, it's clear that better education really does remove most of the observed differences. I heard Gila Hanna talk about that data um, last January at a mathematics meeting in a panel, and the other panelist was also very interesting. Um, she was very interested to learn about a place called Potsdam College in New York, which is very, very successful in producing mathematics majors. They produce 10 to 20 times the number of math majors that you would expect from a college of that size, and 60% of those majors are women. So they're just wildly successful both at teaching mathematics and in encouraging women to study mathematics. And so she went there for a long period of time to observe and study and question to see what it was they were doing right. What she found was interesting. 
First of all, they had a primarily male faculty with only one woman. They made no special effort to encourage or attract women. Gender was not an issue, either implicit or explicit. The system was very patriarchal in the sense that the description given most frequently by both faculty and students of the male teachers was, quote, a stern but loving father, unquote. Not what you would expect, and yet they were, in fact, wildly successful. So why were they so successful? Well, they were so successful because they taught mathematics different from every place else. They made a major effort to encourage all of their students of both sexes so that no special effort to encourage the girls was necessary. They simply encouraged all of them. They were also some very, very significant differences in the teaching methodology they used that were, again, very, very successful that I won't go into in detail. A less traditional lecture methods. The point is, and I think that this is an important point to make because some years ago it was thought, well, you know, if we just remove the blatant sex discrimination, the differences between boys and girls or men and women will disappear, and they didn't, and people said, gee, maybe we're wrong, and their big debate, is it biological, is it cultural, is there still, still subtle discrimination? There certainly is some of that, but I think the most important point is that sometimes seemingly equal behavior for a variety of cultural reasons, affects girls and boys differently. And that can be both positive and negative. And that in educational systems that are non-sexist and high quality, it's not just enough to be non-sexist. It also must be that the educational system is very encouraging and very high quality. Then these differences do disappear. And there is actually a lot of other uh, evidence in support of that. I think that it's very, very important to realize that although we should have more women scientists, and it's important to have women role models, that men can be effective teachers and mentors and encouragers of women. Because right now, they are most of the scientists. Last night at the reception, one of the women asked me if I didn't think that it would help a lot to have more women scientists going out into the schools at role models at a very young age. Well, of course, that's true, but it's also, I think, the wrong question. I think it would help a lot if more scientists, and male as well as female, and right now that means mostly male, would go out into the schools and talk to young children and encourage them and get involved in education. And it's important to have women role models, but we can't emphasize that to the point where we allow male scientists to abdicate their responsibility, OK? It's, the trickle down is too slow, and women scientists are already too overburdened for them to do all the work, OK? Men scientists can be effective. If they're not, they have to make a bigger effort. We have to train them. Something has to be done. But they have to do their share, or it's not going to work. Women scientists cannot do it all alone. And when I say go out into the schools, I mean, I'm talking about first and second grade, OK? You have to start very young. Too many women are lost too late. And I don't want to put down things like math anxiety workshops and intervention programs, but those are a losing battle. You know, I remember when math anxiety became a big issue in the 70s, OK? Since then, a whole generation has gone through. We should have wiped out math anxiety by now. We shouldn't be trying to do things, OK, to clean up, OK, at the high school and college level, trying to cure what ought to be a preventable disease by better education at the grade school level, OK? That's it's really a losing battle unless you change the approach. I'd like to change the topic a little bit and talk about another myth. The myth that there are no women scientists. Now, it's clear that there are women scientists. The Committee of Status of Women in Physics roster has several thousand physicists. The Association for Women in Mathematics has several thousand members, I already said. And the younger women, 20% of the PhDs are going to women. However, this is not the public perception. Um, women scientists 
frequently do not get as much recognition for their accomplishments from their male colleagues as they ought to. Things are certainly improved a lot, it's not as bad, but there are still problems. But they do get some recognition. The lack of recognition that women get outside the profession is much worse than inside at every level. Um, women can, are inevitably characterized as teachers or students. When men, men can be physicists, they can be mathematicians, they can be engineers, they can be scientists. Women, if they're, even if they have a prestigious research appointment with no teaching duties whatsoever, if they have an affiliation with, with a university, no matter how vague, they become teachers to their neighbors and friends, not scientists. You know, I've gone away several times as you know, visiting professor to other universities, it's amazing. You can tell people that point blank and they'll come back a week later and tell me they had understood that I was going there as a student. It doesn't matter, I mean, it, it's real, I mean, I could spend a whole night telling you ridiculous anecdotes of things people say. Last year when I was sabbatical, I had conversations regularly that were almost surreal. I mean, people will do anything to get you into this teacher or student category. <laughs> it's just amazing. Now, one thing that has disturbed me a great deal is that in other areas, the women's study centers have been major movers in sort of making people more aware of women's accomplishments. Unfortunately, in the sciences, this has not been true. And some of the gender difference theorists say, and in principle I would agree with them, that really, you know, just finding, you know, these historical forgotten women, sort of the, the so-called ad women in stir prescription is really not enough. We need to look at things and be more insightful. And roughly speaking, that's true. But in doing so, they have somehow managed to the, some of the worst of them, to deny the existence of women scientists at all. Sandra Harding, whom I regard as one of the worst of the gender theorists, claims, and I quote, that there are few women worthies to restore to science's hall of fame, unquote. Sherry Turkle, who's written a book on alleged gender differences in computer science, makes virtually no mention of the accomplishments of women scientists in her book. A um, couple of years ago, I was browsing in a Harvard Square bookstore, and I ran across a book called Almanac of American Women in the 20th Century. It had, I don't know how many, over a thousand listings of women and events. So I picked it up, and I looked up the names of the first six women who came to mind. This was not a definitive list. If I thought about it, I'd come up with a much better list, a much longer list. However, there is no doubt in my mind that all six women ought to have been listed. Four of the six were not mentioned. One of the four women who was not mentioned was Maria Goppert Meyer, who, for those who don't know, won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1963 for the nuclear shell model. Now, when winning the Nobel Prize in nuclear physics is not worth a mention in a book on notable American women, something is very, very seriously wrong. I mean, really. Of the two women who were mentioned, we're also a little curious. One of them was Julia Robinson, who's a mathematician. Uh, there was a brief mention of, of her obituary I thought it was a little curious um, that her death was considered more notable than the fact that she solved Hilbert's 10th problem, um, but that wasn't so bad. What I found most disturbing was the treatment of Chen Shen Wu. She, her name was mentioned in a list of women who had received some award from Radcliffe, and that was all that it said. The innocent reader would never know that Madame Wu was a physicist, that she had done a very, very famous experiment that proved that parity was not conserved in certain types of high energy physics reactions, that she had received the Bonner Award in nuclear physics and almost every other award for this work, 
or that she had been president of the American Physical Society. Now, this is really inexcusable. It's conceivable that leaving out Maria Meyer could somehow be a mistake. I mean, an oversight. I don't know how, but maybe if you're really imaginative, <laughs> you can see how she could have forgotten Maria Meyer. But in the case of Dr. Wu, her name was there, and the author of the book didn't even bother to find out and tell the readers what she had done to receive that award. And in my opinion, that is inexcusable. And unfortunately, entirely too much of this is going on. I'm particularly concerned about computer science because there we don't have to delve way back deep into history, OK, in order to find it. I mean, women at the beginning of computer science, it was a tremendous opportunity for women. For many women who wanted to be scientists, uh, you know, right after World War II, there were very few opportunities. And computer science was one of the few places where there were opportunities. And there were lots of women who went into computer science, made very significant contributions, were very, very successful. Women like Mina Reese, uh, forget Mrs. Goldstein's first name, Phyllis Fox, Mary Hawes, and several others whom I will mention momentarily. I mentioned Sherry Turkle's book and the fact that she didn't make any mention of women. And in particular, she mentions the computer language COBOL without ever mentioning Grace Hopper. I might add that her mention of COBOL uh, reveals a certain ignorance of the subject because she in one line describes both COBOL and FORTRAN as, quote, IBM business languages, unquote. Um, but I, uh, last January, criticized her for mentioning COBOL and not mentioning Grace Hopper, who had invented COBOL. Only to my embarrassment to come home, open my mail, discover the newsletter from the Association for Women in Mathematics with an article saying that it was not Grace Hopper, but Jean Samet that invented COBOL. Now, actually, I wasn't all that wrong, but I did learn some things that I didn't know before. Uh, what is true is that COBOL, which was the, the first widely used higher level computer language, was uh, invented by a committee based upon pr principles that Grace Hopper had been advocating for a long time. And the credit that she gets is certainly very, very well deserved. However, it turns out that the person who headed the committee that actually implemented the language was not Grace Hopper, but another woman by the name of Jean Samet. Furthermore, on that committee, there were five other women who played major roles. Now, the language that they came up with, which was supposed to be an interim language, was wildly successful, much more than they imagined for virtually 20 years until the late 1970s, COBOL was the most widely used computer language in the world. That's important because this, it's not simply that these women, Grace Hopper, Jean Samet, and five others, did something significant. It was not just a major achievement. It was an influential achievement. Because it was most, the most widely used language for so many years, it had a major influence on the way computer science developed. Computer science did not start out and never has been a male science from the beginning, unlike the other sciences, a fact that one should forget, not forget. Uh, before um, leaving Jean Salmon, I should mention that she was also the first woman president of the Association for Computing Machinery. I did find one and only one woman mentioned in Sherry Turkle's book, namely Anna Augusta Lovelace, whom she incorrectly refers to as Babbage's benefactress. I'll tell you about her and Babbage in a minute, but benefactress is the one thing she wasn't. She, there's no evidence that she ever gave him any money. In fact, um, she regularly had to pawn the family jewels to pay her horse racing debts. Um, Anna Lovelace was the daughter of the poet Lord Byron. She was a collaborator of Babbage 
uh, Charles Babbage invented something called the analytical engine. He actually invented the computer 100 years too early um, because there were not even transistors, much less silicon chips then, he had to make his computer out of gears, and so he never actually got a working model. Lovelace is generally regarded as the world's first programmer. Her entire claim to fame is based on a translation she did of notes that someone took of lectures that Babbage gave on his conception of what computer programming would be. However, in addition to translating the notes, she added notes and appendices of her own that were between two and three times as long as the original article, and generally regarded as much more insightful. This is a very, very significant accomplishment. To pass her off as Turkle does as Babbage's benefactress is, in my opinion, unacceptable. But Turkle is not the worst. About three years ago, there appeared a book by Dorothy Stein on Ada Lovelace, which denied that Lovelace had ever done anything original or significant. Now, one of the things that's true about Ada Lovelace is that over the years, there has been a great deal of apocrypha about her life. And Stein's book does, I think, co correct a lot of this apocrypha. Uh, she seems to add some of her own, but there's no doubt that there is a lot of apocrypha that she does, does correct. However, in correcting this apocrypha, she uncovers no evidence that would discredit her scientific work. And yet Stein concludes on the basis of no evidence whatsoever that Lovelace never did anything original or significant. Now, first of all, she seems to confuse originality with independence. This is a common, I mean, virtually all of Lovelace's work was collaborative work with Babbage. The fact that it was collaborative does not mean that none of it was original, okay? Uh, it's always difficult to sort things out, and there has been some controversy over that. Uh, one of the those who does not regard her work as very original is Babbage biographer Hyman, who regards her only as, quote, Babbage's interpretus. But even he credits her by saying that as such, her achievements were very remarkable. Stein has even uncovered evidence that would give Lovelace more credit because Hyman claims, and there's been some controversy over this, that Lovelace did not write a famous program to compute Bernoulli numbers that Babbage did, whereas in her correcting this apocrypha, apocrypha uh, she also claims to have found new and, in my opinion, convincing evidence that Lovelace did write the Bernoulli number program. And yet, she still concludes that Lovelace never did anything significant. Now, what's really distressing about this is not that she wrote a bad book or that she discredits and disparages Lovelace. There are always going to be people writing bad books and discrediting women. Guessing about this is not that she wrote a bad book or that she discredits and disparages Lovelace. There are always going to be people writing bad books and discrediting women. What's distressing is that this book was widely reviewed and praised as an example of landmark feminist scholarship. I don't know when discrediting women became feminist scholarship. I mean, now I think one reason for this is that none of these reviewers were computer scientists. They were historians, philosophers, sociologists, and they just swallowed hook, line, and sinker. I don't know why. I don't know why it didn't occur to them to ask a computer scientist. And I don't know why it didn't occur to the Women's Studies Journal sending this book out to review to send it to a computer scientist. But they didn't. I think that that brings up one of the major problems and issues that needs to be corrected, that there need to be more interactions between women scientists and non-scientists. And they need to be very, very innovative types of collaborations, because unlike other fields where a woman in literature can do, you know, it, she doesn't have to abandon her research to write about women writers, or similarly a woman historian, the gap is much bigger for women scientists, and it doesn't make any sense for them to abandon their scientific work 
but they do they should be involved with women's studies programs they should be asked to collaborate to give their opinion to review book books to comment on proposed research to give their insights so that we can avoid some of the more outrageous egregia that I have referred to tonight. So I'd be happy to answer some questions now. Any questions? Yes. Well, that is a serious problem, and I must say that since I've gotten involved in this, I've been amazed at how much of my time that, it, that, that it's taken. And that's why I said that these interactions do need to be innovative, okay? Uh, we, I mean, women scientists should not be undertaking, you know, sociological products to study women scientists, but the women sociologists or the male sociologists who undertake these projects ought to go across the street to the women in their math and physics departments and talk to them first. Or if there are courses in the social sciences that bear upon women scientists, they ought to go across the street and ask some of the women scientists on their campus to give one or two guest lectures, to give some opinion on the curriculum. Um, there are a lot of interesting articles in newsletters like the Association for Women in Math and the Committee on the Status of Women in Physics, and I found that surprisingly few women's studies groups across the country even get these journals and have them in their libraries. So it, what you described is a very, very serious problem, and I think we have to be innovative, and sometimes women scientists will say no. That doesn't mean they're not interested, but it's, it's something that has to be dealt with. And I think we also have to, that's why one of the things I mentioned before, if we can get men to do more of the work of encouraging women scientists, we can take some of the burden off them there and release them some other ways. But it, it's, a, it's a problem when we have to be imaginative. Get C's and virtually none get B's. 
Okay, if they are, they drive. That never occurs to the, to the engineers. Whereas you see an enormous number of boys with no ability whatsoever <laughs> <laughs> at the C minus B plus level, and they have brought up, they're brought up to believe that they should be engineers, and they hang in there. And I think this is very, very bad. And you know, you give an exam and you'll say, okay, you know, 60 is a C. If you got below 50, drop the course. The next day, two girls with 75 will drop, and there's a guy with 32 in your office saying, if I get an A on the final. <laughs> this, I think, is a serious problem. We need to encourage more C plus B minus women and get rid of these two guys. Because not only do you need more women, but if you teach these guys, believe me, I don't want to drive over a bridge to save his life. I don't want to fly in and, and I mean, I do have two former students who now have jobs writing programs for the automatic pilots that run airplanes such as I flew on to get here. <laughs> Unfortunately, both of them have A's, but you know, you see these margins. I don't want them having those jobs. So we need to change. It's not only the question of these women, but society needs to change the proportions of men and women so that we can have better quality people in these types of responsible positions. Well, just, just, just raising the standards at college. I mean, I, what, I mean, what we need to do is, is culturally raise women differently, so that the minute they don't, you know, they get below 95, they don't think, oh, I can never be a mathematician. We need to raise men and women different culture, and it's interesting what you said about raising standards, because there have been a number of articles lately, like the one I mentioned about constant culture, several others. The program that are most successful at encouraging women to study science and at encouraging blacks and Hispanics to study science are programs which have higher standards than average. It's very interesting. The most successful programs don't have, or not, the remedial programs have been a complete disaster, particularly if you read about the Berkeley program of black students. Programs with higher standards that encourage capable women, capable children of all ethnic groups are much more successful. Encouraging women and encouraging children from other ethnic groups doesn't mean lowering standards. If you do it right, it'll raise standards. Prestigious 
person who headed one of the country's uh, <coughs> top math departments, called him up, <laughs> told him what happened. He said, send me the paper, I'll take care of it. And he did. In the meantime, I complained to the editor, too, who sent it out to a referee and gave it a rave review. And they published the paper. Now, based upon certain comments made to me by people in the editorial office when I called them up to harangue and both before and after, I did not believe that sex discrimination was involved at all. In fact, I had a male co op. I do believe, I, I don't, well, I have, I have some suspicion as to why the editor initially rejected it. But whatever his reason was, I am convinced that he thought he could get away with something outrageous because both I and my co-author were not very prestigious people from not very prestigious institutions. That's a situation in which women are much more likely to find themselves in. And because of the way women are raised, a lot of them wouldn't have picked up the phone and called the head of the company. But, I mean, it was the thing to do. I mean, I, you know, that's the kind of of the, you know, there's an obnoxious kind of pushiness, and there's something that women are not culturally trained to do that they should do, to realize that there are times when someone's being outrageous and you ought to protest. And in my career, and I'm actually very good at that, but, <laughs> <laughs> and I don't mean to sound overly idealistic, I certainly know of cases in which women are treated unfairly and they protest and it's very sad and those things, or that certainly happens. Um, but I found that when I do raise valid objections, I tend to win a very, very high percentage of the time. And I think women need to be something different in their cultural training to teach them when you, when you should raise objections and how to do it effectively. And that's not a kind of pushiness that I think we should characterize as masculine. Questions? 